Welcome to Strip Coverlet. I'm Adrian Fort, and we are here for the sixth in a 29 part series. As we travel chapter by chapter through This Is Not a Writing Manual by Carrie Majors, and this chapter is entitled Watch Your Soap Operas. And I will start this video with a quote from the text. This is the first paragraph to the chapter. All through middle school and high school, my afternoons were marked by a special hour spent with my mom, during which we would hunker down on the couch and watch another world, A.W. Yes, a soap opera. One of those long running, 35 years for A.W. starting in 1964, television dramas that keep millions of viewers in their full thrall for big chunks of their adult lives. For me, and I'm not kidding here, uh, through this period of my life, that television show watched with my mother was Buffy the Vampire Slayer paired with uh, reruns of X-Files and Jeopardy. Uh, I was a pretty cool kid. Seriously though, uh, it makes me wonder if there is something nascent about this period uh, in a young person's life, in a young storyteller's life in particular, that they are looking for guidance. Uh, it is perhaps evolutionary. Storytellers would have been an integral part of early human societies and in the ages of 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, you would have definitely been counted on to earn your keep in some degree. If you were not an apprentice storyteller, you would have been telling stories uh, for the society at large. Um, is this some semi-vestigial yearning? Uh, and it makes me wonder, do you have stories like this from the middle school and high school years of your life? Is there some perhaps regrettable uh, piece of fiction or television show or series of movies that you watched time and time again as you were looking uh, for advice, for, for direction as a storyteller, or perhaps just soaking it in, uh, as, as it was for me. at that During that period of my life, I was not particularly productive as a writer, but learning those simple elements of storytelling was important for me. And in this chapter, Major goes, Majors goes on to make the argument for rather than against a, a type of storytelling such as soap operas and what they do for developing storytellers. The argument goes basically as such, are soap operas high art? No. No, they are not. Uh, but they contain the basic, raw, naked elements of storytelling, the visceral things with which we were to which we respond, uh, which are necessary for developing storytellers to garner an understanding of. Um, she lists these 11 points, and I'm paraphrasing here. Characters are first, which is the first point, obviously. Two, audience awareness. Three, bad guys are fun. Four, everyone likes to laugh once in a while. Five, setting matters. Six, big events equals big stories. Seven, buzz is good. Eight, anticipation is good. Nine, too much is disaster. Ten, too much anticipation is disaster, that is. Ten, make your character want something. And eleven, basically be controversial. Uh, there's got to be something interesting for your reader to do something interesting for your reader's mind to play with as he or she is reading, which is which is a lot of where I have a problem with this idea of problematic storytelling. A lot of times the element of a story with which you are meant to be grappling is something that is not handed to you, is not spoon-fed to you. And when it is spoon-fed to you, that is not storytelling it is something more akin to propaganda. Um, so the, these problematic stories, if you were looking at them through your own eyes, should not be problematic because it should be something within the text that you are wrestling with, right? It is the idea presented as it is in the text. You were left as the reader to make an argument. You're not s supposed to necessarily be spoon-fed what the writer thinks. Um, and I just welcomed a wave of dislikes to this video, I'm sure. But another mode of storytelling where you can pick up on all of these things, in addition to um, soap operas, I think that something from my youth I'm a little more familiar with is professional wrestling. 
the bad guy comes out and he's booed, the good guy comes out and he's cheered. During the match, there is an up and a down, and eventually, even though you already knew this, the good guy wins. And that is something that you you are able to intuit when you are nothing more than a child. I remember watching uh, Ultimate Warrior when I was just, I was real little at the time. This would have been pre-kindergarten. But you, you see a character like the Ultimate Warrior when you want to root for him, right? And that is something uh, that a storyteller has to understand and on a more advanced level is able to manipulate. Can I make you root for the bad guy? Can I make you jeer the good guy? Uh, where are the points in the story where I am allowed to flip these roles for the characters from the eye of the reader? And is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? How must your reader respond to these things? Um, moving on, this is a quote from 35 that I found very interesting. Very interesting. It is something that I did not know about professional writing. Speaking of irony, by the time I stopped watching AW regularly, I actually had a brush with writing for soaps. I'll spare you the details because it never worked out, but let's just say that in the process I glimpsed how just how hard it is to write for one. There are multiple tiers of teams of multiple tiers and teams of writers, and this works basically the same for many television shows. The smallest, presumably highest paid umbrella group comes up with the long-term story arcs. They then give their story outline to the next group who figure out what's going to happen with each character on a weekly, then daily, basis. And they, finally, hand that info down to the dialogue writers who put the words into the characters' mouths. And that was something that I did not know either, and have never a process that I have never been exposed to, but it is an interesting uh, nugget from which to really start looking at things differently uh, on that level. The second quote on 35 is one that hit me particularly hard. Uh, starts on 35 and spills to 36. And it reads as such. Anyway, the point of all this is not that you should find a soap opera and watch it. The point is that you should find a method of storytelling that you, that you love that is not reading and study it. Ask yourself what makes it tick and why you like it. Let it teach you and find ways to apply its lessons to your writing. Yarn's very own Lords Kirchigan, Kirchgerian, Kirchgerian, made a point along similar lines in her great blog, Film Equals Writing School, in which she discusses several films that have taught her things uh, about writing that no book ever could have. Um, I'm finding Major's writing increasingly difficult to read because it just, it, I, 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 I'm not sure I'm a fan of the way she uses words sometimes. But anyway, that, that quote hit me particularly hard because in the midst of my grad school uh, days, I was a bit lost. I was trying too hard to innovate, I think. I was trying too hard to become the writer that I thought I could be. I was trying too hard to be different. I was trying too hard to be a writer, an artiste, right? Um, and it was then that I found a YouTube series that I still enjoy and will harken back to from time to time. Uh, this series is known as Mr. Plinkett. Uh, the guys from Red Letter Media. And Mr. Plinkett's reviews, namely the ones where he destroys the Star Wars prequels, were very helpful for me. Uh, it was a simple and entertaining way to be refreshed on the basics of storytelling. And if I remember, I will leave a link to a few of those in the, in the description below. But they are very, they're, they're done creatively, which is definitely a plus. Um, but they are a really bare bones way to look at storytelling in general and how the Star Wars prequels failed at those things. So that is it for this episode of This Is Not a Writing Manual by Carrie Majors. We will be back next time with my first big mistake, which is over pages 37 through 43.
If you liked this, I hope that you hit the like button and hit subscribe if you have not already. And I hope to see you for the rest of this series.